Let's talk a little bit about your judicial work. Um, how do you use law clerks? No, I use them mostly for research and mostly for discussion. That is, uh, in, in, um, um, when we have a difficult case, I try to bring all of them into everything. The law clerks are absolutely necessary for handling one of our jobs, which is the job of taking 8,000 cases filed over the year. Those are requests for hearing. That's 150 a week, about. And then reducing them to the 80 cases that we actually hear. So each week I'll get 150 cases to read and probably only select one or two to hear. Now that's a very small number of selections out of a lot of cases. And there are only about 10 or 12 that are even possible that anyone would think of considering for granting. So what the law clerks do is they take all the papers and they reduce them to memoranda. So I'll get a stack of memoranda from the law clerks in this building. And I'll read through them pretty quickly. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the nature of the legal question, not whether the judge below was right or wrong. Everybody's had an appeal. They've had a trial. Maybe they've had two appeals. It's the nature of the legal question. For what we are trying to do here is we're trying to uh, decide those legal questions, those federal legal questions, where there are differences of opinion, typically, in the lower courts. And so you need uniformity. Well. That's one of their jobs, to summarize the issue in those cases, summarize those cases. And I'll go back to the papers sometimes if I need to. But the main thing is when we're writing opinions, the first thing I'll always do is have my law clerk write a very, very long draft or a memo. Call it what you want. And I've read the briefs. The law clerk's read the brief. I've already gotten a memo from the law clerk. Now, that law clerk will go back and write something that has about everything in it that I can think of. And uh, with some analysis and a lot of cases and whatever. Now, I use that as a data. And I will then read that. I will then read the briefs again. And then I sit at the machine in back of us and write my own draft, which is much shorter. And sometimes has things in it that weren't in the memo, but more likely uses this as raw material to construct a set of arguments that I think are the right ones. If they're not there, I'll try to get some more information. Um, then I write my draft, give it back to the clerk, and the clerk will critique it and uh, edit. Usually with me, I then get it back, and I feel I don't like it, and I have to go all over again. So I'll normally write two drafts from scratch. Whether it's one or two, it is normally true. Two. I'll then use the clerk to uh, edit, critique, and, and discuss. I like to discuss difficult things with all my clerks together. And uh, it, it works very well. I and mean, we'll go back and forth, like uh, eventually uh, editing something that we started with into shape where I think I can circulate it. Back in 1964 65, you clerked for Justice Arthur Goldberg. Mm -hmm. How much has clerking changed uh, from how it was in those days? I think not too much, that we had two clerks instead of four. And I think the reason we have more clerks now is because of the tremendous growth in the number of requests for hearings. They've grown maybe from 2,500 to 8,000. And so there's a need for more of the summarizing uh, to be done. Uh, but otherwise, the job is pretty similar uh, with Arthur Goldberg, whom I love, who's a wonderful man, and a great judge. And, uh, we would discuss everything, and he liked to talk about things. And it was fun and interesting, and we did a lot of research. Did that experience um, give you a greater sense of the history of your current job, and, and uh, did yeah, it I help you so. in some way? I think, well, as a person, I think he was a very practical person. He wanted to achieve concrete objectives, and he would be impatient. Uh, with some kind of discussion in an opinion that seemed too theoretical that wasn't getting anywhere. He, he wanted to, uh, things to make a difference, to be clear, to be practical. I think as a court, the court at that time had an overwhelming problem, and the overwhelming problem was uh, racial segregation. So the Warren Court was trying to deal uh, with a set of legal issues uh, that came down to whether legal segregation would be permitted in the United States or not. Brown versus Board had said no, but to make it no, 
you had to dismantle an entire set of legal rules that had underlay a set of practices that meant racial segregation. Uh, so they were very, very busy uh, at that task. And it was a court, in a sense, with a mission. The mission was a constitutional mission, to see that people were not discriminated against on the basis of race. Um, today, I think that you can't, it's harder to find a, a single overarching constitutional mission. On a personal level, what did you learn from Justice Goldberg? On a personal level, I learned he was a marvelous person, and I learned that well, actions have consequences. I would say that's the most important thing. What you're going to decide in an opinion is not a theoretical game. Uh, what you're going to decide is going to matter in the world, and, and therefore it's important to pay attention to those consequences, because human beings will be affected. Is it true that shortly before you became a federal judge, Justice Goldberg, I think then retired, um, implored you never to use a footnote? Yes, but it's not true before I became a federal judge. I think, uh, he, I think it was after I'd been a federal judge for a year or two. And he said, there's no point using a footnote. If, if, if you want to put something in a footnote, make a decision. Is it relevant and important or not? If it's important to your argument, put it in the text. And if it's not important, throw it out. You're not there to prove to everybody how clever you are. You're not writing an opinion to show you're well read. You're writing an opinion as a useful document to lawyers and judges. So the citation either plays a role or it doesn't. Is it true that you've never used a footnote as a Supreme Court Since justice? Since as a Supreme Court justice, I think it's true. I mean, it's possible sometimes that you have to write a footnote to say of something about another judge in our court, a justice who's joining an opinion in part A but not part B or something, but, uh, but I can't think of an instance in which I've used a footnote. Among scholars, your writing style is known especially for its clarity. How hard is it to achieve clarity when you're writing about legal subjects? I think it's not easy. I, because the trouble is often you know too much about it by the time you've gotten into the subject. And so you assume a lot of knowledge on the part of the reader. And the reader may, might not have that knowledge. And if you make an effort and think you're explaining it to your, your spouse, your wife, your husband, your daughter, your son, uh, you're explaining it to someone. Go through the explanation so they can understand it. And then the reader will understand it. But it, it does require, that's why I think for me, it requires a lot of drafts. Now, there's some writers that don't need a lot. P.G. Woodhouse had an exhibit at the Morgan Library. And the extraordinary thing, since he was a great writer, is to look at his drafts. They came out of the typewriter to the publisher without a change. I can't do that. And you probably can't think of many other writers who can no. do that. No. I can think of some great writers who couldn't. I've seen the manuscripts that Proust wrote, and they're filled with changes. <laughs> so, uh, but it's nice to be able to do it if you could, but I can't. Do you think it matters whether ordinary people can understand judicial opinions? Yes. Why? Well, particularly in this court, uh, because uh, if an ordinary uh, a uh, person who's not a lawyer can understand it. I think that gives weight to what the court does, and law is supposed to be intelligible. They should be able to follow it with the lawyer or the judge, should be able to, uh, without uh, uh, having to take special vocabulary courses. And uh, the purpose of an opinion is to give your reasons. And you give your reasons both for guidance, but also it should be possible for readers to criticize the writer. Now, people can't criticize what I say. They can't explain why they think it's wrong unless they can understand. Brandeis said that once. He said, first, we have to understand what an opinion means before we can say whether it was right or wrong. Do you have an opinion on legalese? I'm against it. Legalese, you mean jargon, legal jargon? Terrible. Terrible. I, I, I would try to avoid it as much as possible. No point. Adds nothing. I, I just find very little. I, I'm sure there are some instances where there is a necessity for it, but I have not found one, or I can't find many. What does it say to you about a lawyer who uses a lot of that jargon? 
do well. And so it would be helpful to me if he did. <laughs> and uh, if he's trying to disguise the fact that he has no argument, he's not going to get away with that. You were a professor at Harvard Law School uh, from 1967 to 1981, and the faculty had some really great legal writers at the time. Which ones did you admire for their writing style? I thought my colleague John Ely had a very good writing style, wrote very clearly. A lot of them wrote very clearly. A course I liked was the Hart and Sachs course on uh, jurisprudence, it was the legal process, and Al Sachs was very clear in his writing there. Uh, uh, he, he, and Paul Freund was always very clear when he wrote. Uh, the, there were, there were m most were clear, I think. I don't think there was a clarity problem. And Lon Fuller was a Yes, Lon philosopher. Fuller too, a philosopher and always clear. Mm -hmm. Seems to me you can do that. There's a great saying I like. I think it's Ortega y Gasset. We'd said something to the effect of, of clarity is the courtesy or politeness of the author. Have any writers outside law been major influences on you as a writer? Okay, outside law. Well, if I read novels, I uh, you know I can I know I know what I like. Say if you if you a certain kind of clarity I do admire. So what is Stendhal writes very, very clearly. I said, that's, that's marvelous. That's good. I can't do that. But uh, I would prefer, a, I, I, I would certainly prefer a great book that is clear. Um, but when you're talking about great authors, they're great authors for many different reasons. If we exclude present Supreme Court justices, um, who do you think were the best writers ever to sit on the court? Jackson is a great writer. Why great. did you like his stuff so much? Because he's able to, he's clear and he's able to use metaphor in a way that uh, makes it work in the legal area. That's hard to do. Now, I mean, Cardoza, of course, could do that. Cardoza, see, he, the, 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 the cry of distress is the call to rescue. Very clear in a case where the issue is when and under what circumstances there is an obligation on a person to save another person and in the process not behave negligently. The cry of distress is the call to rescue. It helps in that context. And Cardoza was a genius at that. I rather like a, uh, Jackson had a case where he wrote once something to do with natural gas pricing regulation, a subject that used to be dear to my heart because I had taught administrative <laughs> law. But uh, he, he uh, uh, said neither, the, neither the, the wit of man, neither the wealth of Midas nor the wit of Solomon or something would ever be able to understand or to do enough to make clear uh, the principles of natural gas pricing regulation. That just juxtaposition was funny, uh, quite true, uh, uh, and uh, uh, made it a, a dry subject interesting, and also was illuminating. In, in Korematsu, he complained about the court's opinion, which I think he was quite right. The court's opinion upheld the detention of the Japanese. Most of us would say it was very wrong. And he said, well, whatever they thought, they shouldn't have written an opinion that would, well, uh, but we create a precedent, he said, like a loaded gun pointed at the head of an innocent person. Mm. Quite right. Uh, uh, so he was dramatic, but very, very good. Holmes is a great writer. But Holmes is so metaphorical and succinct that sometimes it isn't clear what he's driving at. Almost laconic. Yes, yes, yes. And, and but, they, but he's certainly a great writer. Brandeis, Brandeis from time to time is. Brandeis, who I rather admire enormously. Brandeis is so interested, however, in the depth of the opinion. He wants to get into the details. And of course, I think you should do that. I think it's helpful for a judge to do that. But most of the judges whom I admire write well. Learned Hand certainly writes well. All the great judges. Very hard to find a great judge, one who is now admired, who didn't write well. In fact, isn't it almost that they wrote so well that makes them 
so admired. Isn't the writing the most important thing a, a judge does? Well, there is a theory to that, but I'm not sure I accept it. I, d I don't think someone who isn't a good judge could become a good judge simply by writing. Yes. I mean, ultimately, the, the question is what of interpreting the law, the question is applying the law, the people who are affected are the people in front of you or others who will have to live under the law. And I think if you don't have a sound view as to how these cases should come out and how the law should fit together, I doubt that you could make up for it by good writing. I mean, if you're very clear, you might just be very clearly wrong. <laughs>